Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm John Hudson. I'm the pastor here at Pilgrim Church, United Church of Christ at 25 South Main Street in Sherburne, Massachusetts, and I welcome you. And the reason I do that every week is so those who are watching at home or from far away know exactly uh, where we are. And so I welcome you, and I welcome the people who are at home or watching on YouTube later. Uh, welcome you on this absolutely beautiful New England Sunday. I don't know about you, I'm going out for a long bike ride this afternoon. Um, and just um, to lift up kind of a prayer of thanksgiving, um, for those of you who were here last week, we had a great opening Sunday. Um, and uh, we are just so happy that the church was filled with people, and I wanted to let you know we started our youth groups, and we had a big group for the high school over in Dover, and we had a nice group of middle school kids here at uh, Pilgrim, and, and so welcome. I, just one thing I want us to think about here. So does anyone here think that we're back to normal? So let me, I just want to talk about a couple of things today about normal. Um, uh, one of my pastor friends said, instead of using the word normal, maybe use the word ordinary or routine. Um, but, um, but it means that we're all going to be in different places. And so um, I have decided I'm going to pull back and be a little more cautious. This week I found out that my cousin, David, who's a firefighter, who's younger than me, had COVID, and he got blood clots in his legs. And so it's like this 10% of people who get this leftover stuff. And, and so I, I need to say that because we're all in different places, and I would encourage you to do what you need to do to feel comfortable. And not just here, but I would say out in the world too. And don't be embarrassed about that. Don't apologize for that, because this is kind of our, our new place in the world. Um, and so um, one of the things that goes along with that, I need to say, is, is that um, we used to be used to like a bunch of kids showing up every single Sunday. That's not the reality anymore, is it, Lindsay? No, because Sunday morning is, is just another morning now, and there's lots of stuff going on. And, and so the thing I want us to think about is how can we welcome whoever is here on Sunday morning? Can I get an amen for that? And then when someone walks in who hasn't been there for a while, don't say, where have you been? <laughs> or even worse, what is your name? But seriously, we, this, is, this is like, we're, we're post-COVID, but we're into this new thing that who knows. But can I just get an amen? We got to roll with it. We just got to roll with it. And I'm convinced that when we roll with it and when we're compassionate with each other, um, and are led by our compassionate God, everything's going to turn out okay. So it's in that spirit that I welcome you here today. Marilyn. Good morning. My name is Marilyn Marlette. I'm a deacon here. And John stole everything I was going to say for a welcome. But welcome. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd like to announce that the flowers this morning are in memory of Evie Cagney. We had a memorial service for her yesterday morning, that was, or yesterday afternoon, I'm sorry, that was lovely. And the flowers are in her memory, and we thank you, um, Bill and family, for those. So with that, we'll start worship with the call to worship that is printed in the bulletin. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside us, helping us along. God does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs, our aching groans. God knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our conditions, keeps us present before the Lord. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives is worked into something good by God.
So one of the images I love um, to use when I talk about both this life and the next life, both mortal life and eternal life, Paul actually uses it in one of his letters, and he compares our lives to, um, on this earth to like a race in a stadium, okay? And we're running that race, but up in the stands are all of the people who have passed on, and they're cheering us on. Isn't that a beautiful image? Um, and so today, uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about loss and grief and, and what that means for us as human beings and as Christians. And so for our time of confession, what I'd like us to do is, um, is to maybe think about uh, and remember and give thanks to God for whoever that person is up in the stands for you today. Does everybody hear that? Who's cheering you on? Who's saying to you, you can do it? Who's saying, I believe in you? Um, because one of the comforts I find in our faith, it's not always the easiest thing to have faith in, but that, that this mortal life here is not the final chapter. It's not the final word. Um, and so we love this life, but we also recognize the next. And so let's just take a moment this day to think about who's up in the stands for us and to thank God for that person. God, this day we, we confess that sometimes we can forget about our own mortality and we can also forget about those who are no longer with us and kind of cheering us on and, and help us, God, to be grateful for those people, for how they have shaped our lives and made this world a better place and, God, let their lives inspire us as people of faith, as followers of Jesus Christ in this time, in this day, and in this place. And God, all of these things we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who runs that race with us and invites us all to pray together as a sign of our unity in him. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so I would invite the young people who are here this morning to come forward for a special message. Mr. McBride is bringing up my, my sign for today that I want to use with all of us. Thank you very much. Okay. Good morning. How was school this week? You only had four days. Was this the first week back? Oh, was it okay? Okay. Jackson? Good. All right. Yeah, fall is about all about starting things up. And one of the things we do here at church is we often will have people come and join us who we haven't seen before. You know, kind of new people. And I want to talk about concepts today. It's really important for us as Christians. You guys say that nice and loud? Can the congregation say that nice and loud? Welcome. Okay. So, what does it mean to welcome someone? 
to greet them. Adults, make them feel comfortable. Listen to them. Smile. Invite them in. What? Invite them in. Invite them in. Be kind. Yep, welcome someone. Open up to them. Because you know what's really hard? And you guys might have experienced this sometimes. Do you ever walk into a classroom and there's only people there? How do you feel? Nervous? Yeah. Yeah. Nervous? And so for a new person to actually walk into church is like, it's a big deal. You don't know anyone. You may not be quite sure what this place is like, right? Um, and so it's our job as people of faith and Christians to make them feel well. Okay? Um, because clearly God brought them here for some reason. And our job is to serve them and to say welcome. And whether you're here just for one day or for a long time, we want to walk with you and we want to love you and we want to worship God with you and we want you to be a part of our community. What do you think about that? A good idea. So, in the weeks ahead, when a new kid shows up, will you welcome them? Please. All right. Okay. All right, let's bow our heads and uh, put our hands together and talk. God, for the gift of this day, we thank you. And we thank you for the times when we walked in the back of this church and we were welcomed. And God, we ask you to inspire us to be a welcoming people for any and all the people you would bring to us in the days and weeks and months and years ahead, God. Knowing that you always ask us to welcome people in with open hearts and with open doors and with open minds. And all this we ask in Christ's name. Let everybody say, Amen. Amen. All right. You guys can go downstairs with Lindsay and Annie Nichols, and you're going to do a little program today. And um, I apologize for not putting on my microphone. I'll remember to do that next week. And Bob, can you come and get the sign? <laughs> Good morning. The scripture today is from Jeremiah, verse 8. Um, starts with, excuse me, chapter 8, verse 18, going to chapter 9, verse 1, through verse 1. It's on page 619, 619 in your pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. My joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Hark, the cry of my poor people from afar and wide in the land. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king not in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their foreign idols? The harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. For the hurt of my people, my poor people, I am hurt. I mourn and dismay has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has the health of my poor people not been restored? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Thank you, Beth. For those of you who uh, are, want to dig a little deeper into the Bible, that, 
the, the, the form of biblical literature that we just heard is called a lamentation. Um, and I'll admit, I don't preach on it much. Um, but uh, there's actually a whole book in the Old Testament um, of lamentations. It's, it's when people just need to be sad or to grieve. Um, and so it's another way that a very ancient text actually relates very clearly to us in these days. So let's be in a spirit of prayer together. Let us pray. Oh God, be in our hearts, our minds, our souls, our mouths, our ears. Take away anything that blocks us from listening to you, and yes, God, being changed by you. Amen. And again, from that text, my joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick. Is the Lord not in Zion? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. I mourn. Is there no balm in Gilead? It was a week of grief, of grief and mourning. I know for me, and certainly for our church, and yes, even for our world, a big part of our world, Some of you know that last Sunday night, my 79-year-old Aunt Donna, who lived in Florida with my late Uncle Billy, both of whom were so, so loving to me all of my life, who hosted me for blessed rest in the week after Christmas for the past 19 Decembers. On Sunday, Donna very suddenly and unexpectedly died, leaving behind five kids and six grandkids and a family and community bereaved and in shock. Last Sunday morning actually began a week of mourning and remembrance for us as a church community because we learned that Peter Lifferton's beloved wife, Evelyn, died after a hard struggle with cancer. A wonderful wife and mother, she loved nature and hiking and God's creation and died at 78. Then one of our church's brightest of lights, one of our matriarchs, Ruth Stewart, she of great Christian hospitality and care for so many years here at church who, with her beloved John, spent a life in the church kitchen serving others, who was also a school nurse at Pine Hill. She died on Tuesday at the age of 89. And then yesterday, we remembered in a celebration of life, Evie Cagney, who, along with Bill, was for so, so many years very active here at church. Wow, That's, that's a lot of death and a lot of grief. And a lot of mourning, even for someone like me who spends a good part of my professional life helping those who grieve. That's a lot of death for our church. We who have, for 337 years, been a place to come and to commend to God our loved ones, to the eternal care of God in heaven. And then hovering over all of this, at least for me, over the entire globe, in a way, was the death of England's Queen Elizabeth II at 94. Now, I'm not a royalist, but I don't know, maybe you, like me, were amazed and had your breath taken away by the collective grief and mourning that is happening in Great Britain, and yes, around the world. I mean, I have never seen anything like it. Maybe the closest we would have come to it is the morning that happened after John F. Kennedy was killed. But in 61 years, I've never seen such a communal and shared sense of loss by millions of people. I actually have a little video for us to look at this day. It's the video of the line, the line, the queue, that was in its third day on Friday morning and almost five miles long. And it was just people waiting in line to see the queen who ruled for two generations of Britons lying in state at Westminster Hall. And today, the British government actually asked people no longer to get in line because their wait would be more than 40 hours. And so probably at the end of it, a big percentage of the entire population of Great Britain will have kind of stood in that line, queued up, and gone through and saw Queen Elizabeth in the 
coffin with a crown and a scepter uh, lying in state in Westminster Hall. I mean, the amazing thing is, I don't know if you've seen any film of it, and then when people get in, it's about like 35 seconds or 40 seconds, and then they leave from the other end of the building. Thanks, Doug. Um, brief. It's at once the most personal and intimate and private of emotions, and also, as we can see by the video, it's one of the most shared and universal and common of human emotions, too. We all grieve. No one escapes it. To love is to risk grief. And to grieve is to have known love and maybe lost love. That word Greek, grief actually comes from the Latin gravere, meaning to make heavy, and also gravis, meaning weighty. And later in the 13th century in France, that word meant to afflict, to burden, or to oppress. For me, that sense of heaviness, of emotional and spiritual weight upon the heart and soul, of being burdened, oppressed by feelings of sadness and loss, that is as good a description of human grief as I've ever heard. Though it is interesting to note that scientists long ago observed that animals grieve too. Animals grieve, they mourn. So in a way, grief isn't just what makes us human. Grief is what makes us alive, in a way. Grief is what makes us have a life, a life given to us by God. Now, grief was the emotion the prophet Jeremiah is afflicted by and wrestling with in the Old Testament passage we heard this morning. To give you a little context, the year was 600 BCE uh, in the ancient Middle East. Now, Israel at that point had split into two bickering factions, a nation in the north and one in the south, and they were both falling apart. They had fallen away from God. They had embraced a corrupt religion. They were worshiping idols. The priests were lining their pockets with offerings at the temple, and the poor and the hungry and the widow and the stranger were ignored. And to top it all off, the nation of Babylon, which was a mighty militaristic state, they were standing on the border ready to invade from the north and kill thousands of people and then carry them off into slavery uh, the rest of the population, which happened about 40 years later. But death, real death, social death, the death of faith, it is rampant, and so the prophet grieves with and for God, God who is also bereft at this rejection by God's people. And so, again, that prophet laments, my joy is gone, grief is upon me, my heart is sick, the harvest is past the summer is ended. Is there no balm in Gilead? Now, we're going to sing a hymn today uh, asking about the balm in Gilead, and that references to a province of Israel called Gilead, where a tree still today grows that gives off a resin, a balm, that is used to heal wounds. Grief. If we all do grieve, then, for lack of a better way of describing it, what might good grief look like. Good grief. And I mean grief that is ultimately grounded in gratitude for the one we loved. Good grief as in grief that helps us to fully lean into and accept our loss, but does not pull us down into a depression or darkness that we cannot escape. Good grief as in a grief that relies upon those who love us, our community, and our God, who also love us and remind us that, yes, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Thou art with me. God is with us. By good grief, I mean a grief that is honest and does not deny the absence we feel at this loss, does not try and sugarcoat it or wish it away through some religious platitudes or cliches like it's all a part of God's plan or God needed another angel. Good grief does not avoid the loss but leans into it and looks it square in the face. Friends, this is how the German pastor and theologian, the Reverend Dietrich Bonhoeffer, spoke about good grief. Quote, 
There is nothing that can replace the absence of someone dear to us, and one should not even attempt to do so. One must simply hold out and endure it. At first, that sounds very hard, but at the same time, it is also a great comfort. For to the extent the emptiness truly remains unfilled, one remains connected to the other person through it. It is wrong to say that God fills the emptiness. God, in a way, does not fill it, but much more leaves it precisely unfilled and thus helps us preserve, even in pain, the authentic relationship. Furthermore, the more beautiful and full the remembrance is, the more difficult the separation. But ultimately, gratitude transforms the torments of memory into silent joy. Do you hear that? Ultimately, gratitude transforms the torment of memory into silent joy. One bears what was lovely in the past, not as a thorn, but as a precious gift deep within, a hidden treasure of which we can always be certain. I have to tell you, friends, I've read a lot about grief, and this, is, this was given to me by someone a couple of weeks ago. It's one of the best definitions I have ever heard, especially for us as Christians. So good grief, my friends, is also very personal and very unique. It's as unique as a human fingerprint We all grieve, yes, but how each of us chooses to grieve, that is between us and our God and no one else. And therefore, there is no right way to grieve and no wrong way to grieve. Do you hear that? It's really important to name that. Years ago, I counseled a family dealing with the death of a mom and a wife, and some relatives were angry at the dad, for in their view, he was not grieving appropriately. You see, the dad was very stoic and very private, and therefore in public, even with his kids, he did not cry and he was not demonstrative. But inside, as his pastor, I knew he was absolutely grieving in his own way. Good grief always respects and honors the grief process of others. And finally, I know for me, good grief is personal, but it is also communal. It is shared with others and always grounded in religious rituals and traditions. The first year I got to Pilgrim Church, 2007, I did something like 15 funerals, including leading services for the Reverend Ken Powell, who had served this church for 28 years. There was a lot of grief at the church in those times. And I am convinced that what saved the church then, and yes, what saved me as a pastor, was the surety and the trustworthiness and the familiarity of our Christian faith traditions and rituals around death. You guys hear that? We know we can fall back into our faith and our grief into the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can fall into the hymn, for all the saints, we feebly struggle, they in glory shine. We can grieve in the faith that somehow, someway, someday, our faith tells us we will see our loved ones again. You know, um, last winter, you, many of you know the story of a young man named Owen Bingham who passed away, and the next day, um, some of the parents who were connected to that said, we have to do something, let's open up the church, and we opened up the church, and we had about 350 people here. It was almost the whole graduating senior class, and most of those kids, guys, are not like big churchgoers, but they knew where they had to be. Does that make sense to everybody? They felt comforted by a faith that they didn't even understand, but they somehow knew that was where they needed to be. That's that's powerful. It talks about our responsibility, but also about just the importance of rituals and traditions. Because after we finish the service, we always depart church, and then we go downstairs, right, and we tell stories, and we eat deviled eggs. Where else do we eat deviled eggs? And we drink coffee, and we're sad, and we're grateful, and we're all together. Do you hear that? We're all together with each other and with God. Rituals and traditions save us in a way. They give shape and purpose to our emotions, including grief. They tie us to those in the past, they who lost to death loved ones as well. 
Good grief is about remembering and embracing our Christian traditions and rituals. So friends, there is a bomb in Gilead, even especially when we grieve and when we hurt and when we miss someone with all our heart and soul and when we need to be sad and when we are at a loss, in the midst of loss. And grief, it can be good, yes, good when we embrace fully and accept that which we have lost, when we allow ourselves and others to grieve in their own unique ways, and when we trust in our God and our God-given traditions and rituals. So in these days, friends, in all days, when we face into death and loss, dear God, please walk with us and guide us and comfort us and wipe away our tears and remind us to be with one another as brothers and sisters in faith. Let all God's people say, Amen. Friends, now is the time when let me just make sure 
Ramon here. When um, we share with each other our prayers, our joys, and concerns, um, and what's on our minds. And so I need to share some sad news this morning. Angie Johnson's father passed away very suddenly, um, either I think it was yesterday or the day before. And so Angie's in the process of kind of figuring out what next steps are. It was in West Virginia. And so please just keep Angie and Scott and the boys and that whole family in your prayers. Um, his name was Mike Graham. Uh, as I mentioned before, but I want to lift up in prayer my cousin David because he's going in for his second surgery this week. And just prayers that he would continue to recover from COVID and for the family of my Aunt Donna. I want to pray for all the names of the people that we lifted up. I want to pray a blessing upon all those who are leaving this week. I think Wednesday or Thursday. Wednesday or Thursday, Dave? Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, it's a church-sponsored trip. It's to Germany and to Italy, and the centerpiece of it is Oberammergau, which is a once-every-ten-year play in Germany about the passion of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to ask, is there anyone who's in church this morning who's going on that trip? And could I ask you to stand? I'm going to do a little prayer and commissioning for you. So, all right. So let's say a prayer together. God, give these people who are here and those who aren't here but who are going on the trip, give them strength, courage, and joy for all that lies ahead for them. Protect them as they travel. Let their experiences be full and rich and let you be in the midst of those experiences and bind them together as a community and then bring them back home to us safely. Just be with them, God, and all this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, thank you. And I'm not going to point out that that's David Tiedman's sister right there, so, and her husband. Um, and it's in the bulletin, but I wanted to just remind everybody that we were going to have a congregational meeting on September 25th. That's been postponed to sometime in October, because the pe some of the, several of the people who are going on the trip wanted to really be at that congregational meeting. The meeting is about establishing a growth fund out of our endowment um, uh, of $100,000 focused specifically on initiatives, programs, and ministries to help grow and revitalize our church. You'll be hearing more about that. So. so are there any prayers of joy or concern that people would like to lift up this day? Heather, nice and loud. So, Heather and Eric are grandparents to a new boy, Mason Avitt Drawsback, uh, son of Kirk and Anna, um, and healthy and doing well. And so we pray for that new family, and we congratulate you on your new status in life. So, other joys or concerns today? Yes, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy. So Cindy Stewart, Ruth's daughter, one of Ruth's two daughters, offers prayers of thanksgiving for, for the love that she experienced and Ruth experienced, especially at the end of her life. There were several Pilgrim Church people who made sure to get by and to spend time with her. So, and we hold you in prayer, too, and Martha and the grandkids. So, Any other joys or concerns this day? Maybe a couple of gratitudes to weigh things out. Anyone? I'm going to have to call on people. Yes, Kate. I'm grateful that we have over 40 Olympic kids from Boston. Is it connected to Medco? So there's 40 kids, half from Boston and half from Sherburne, that are meeting today uh, from the elementary school. Um, pardon? Dover as well, um, just to celebrate being with each other, being in community, and for those of you who don't know about it, and celebrating the METCO pro program as well, which brings kids from the city out to the suburbs, and they go to school with our kids. Um, it's made a huge difference for a long time, 
Kate Potter, who's sitting back there, is the METCO coordinator for the Dover's um, Sherburn School System, and she serves on the school committee. So if you have any complaints about the schools, do not talk to, do not talk to Kate. You're not allowed to talk to her when she's at church about that. <laughs> or in the street, either. I'm only kidding. So. Other joys or concerns? Yes, Frank. Uh, yes, I, we owe a, a great debt of gratitude, I believe, to the people of Martha's Vineyard and to yeah. Governor Baker for being confronted with a, a totally unexpected situation regarding immigration and responding beautifully. And I would say, uh, with, with no disrespect to other religions, in a very Christian way, um, that perhaps will be a, um, an example to the rest of the country. Amen, Frank. So Frank just offers a prayer of thanksgiving and gratitude for um, the people on Martha's Vineyard who welcomed with open arms the folks from Venezuela who were very suddenly uh, duped into flying to Martha's Vineyard. Um, and, uh, and you're right, Frank, I mean, uh, everyone on the island responded, uh, but they stayed at the Episcopal Church on the island, and that's who kind of coordinated everything. And so let their example be an example to us and an example to all people of faith about how to treat the stranger who shows up at our door. The Bible is pretty clear about that. The Bible actually says that there's three groups of people that we're supposed to take care of more than anybody else. The widow, the orphan, and the stranger. And so I would just pray that we would keep that in mind. Other joys or concerns this day? Well, those, those were really good gratitudes, I have to say, so thank you. All right, so let's be in a spirit of prayer together. God, this day we bring to you the prayers that we have spoken out loud and we bring to you the prayers that we have in our hearts. And we trust, God, in ways that we don't always understand, that you will hear our prayers and you will answer our prayers too, but perhaps not in the ways that we expect. But you are faithful, God. Remind us of this truth. Help us to be grateful for your presence in our lives Help us to grieve fully when we need to grieve, to celebrate fully when we need to celebrate, and to embrace everything that it means to live a life, God, to live a good life, and then to leave this life for the next life. Help us to kind of embrace that whole cycle, God, and this day especially to be thankful for those who have left us but who are now up in the stands and cheering us all on. We lift up the names of all of the people that we spoke out loud, and we ask you to enter into our hearts this day, God, and hear the private prayers of our hearts. All of these things and so much more we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so we are blessed to be able to serve each other and to also give our time and our talents and our money to support important ministries like ministries with immigrants and like ministries with the young people that we welcomed to this church last Sunday and to the Dover Church, like ministries um, for grieving and for doing memorial services and funerals. All of those things happen because of our commitment as people of faith here, but also because of our generous donations. And so it's in that spirit of hope and thanksgiving that we will receive this morning's offering. Oh, 
Dear God, you gave us the capacity to love, and knowing that, we risk grief. But you walk with us the entire way and help us to have a good grief and be grateful for the person who has left us. Thank you, dear Lord. Amen. After the benediction and our closing congregational song, you are invited to come downstairs for some coffee and for some goodies and just to be with each other. And so a final benediction, friends. God, we go forth this day um, seeking to live lives of deep gratitude for this day and of courage in the face of loss at times as well. God, remind us, you walk with us every step of the way, that in the person of Jesus Christ, of the cross and of the resurrection, we have an example to live by, and you call us into community, into this church, into all of those circles of love in our lives, to walk with each other too, down into the valleys and up and to the mountaintops and everywhere in between. And so bless us, God, this week and in the days ahead. Let all God's people say, Amen.